Yeah. Okay. So we're going to talk about something that I think is quite an interesting thing. Is, you know, we don't actually get to teach it that all. We're going to talk about Markov chains. Which is something really cool. I didn't learn about when I did probably, so you guys should consider yourself lucky. Um, giving you the lowdown. Um, so, but first, we need to define something else. Uh, something that we've actually used before, but I need to I can yeah. give it a name here. Uh, a random variable. is a function that assigns to each sample point. So you have a sample space. Uh, the sample points are the events uh, in the sample space, which represents the possibilities for some experiment. Uh, so if I take a function that assigns to each sample point, a real number. Uh, we call that a random variable. So pretty much itself, it allows us to kind of look at our our sample space as a as a set of numbers, and that's that's nice. So uh, for example, I could say if x. Uh, X is called a binomial random variable. If the probability that X equals some output is given by Right, that once. So whenever we had a binomial problem and I said, oh, let x be the number of successes, essentially what I was doing was I was defining for you a random variable. And in this case, it's called a binomial random variable. The output, what that output gives us is going to be based on uh, what k value we hit. Here's another way, another example that you can think of. Uh, so say you toss a coin. Let x equals the number of x. Then x just defined a random variable because what does that mean? Well, here are my sample points. Let's call it a sample space. The sample points are, the possibilities are, I can get two heads, or I can get a head and then a tail, or I can get a tail and then a head, or I can get two tails. So these would be h, 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 t, t, h, t, t. These are the sample points. Um, but maybe for some reason I don't want to think of them as h, 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 t, t, h, and blah, blah, blah. So what I can say is I can map this to a function that directly links the sample points to the number of heads. So uh, h, h, of course, would map to the number 2. This would map to the number 1. This would also map to the number 1. And this will map to the number 0. And so, if I ask a question, for example, what is the probability that there are no heads? It's the same as me asking, what is the probability that this variable will output the number zero? Right? So I can talk about uh, my sample space purely in terms of numbers. So I can go from a situation where we're talking about qualitative events to quantitative events. And the benefits of that is now it allows us to use uh, our knowledge of functions to help us with probability. And that idea kind of generalizes, that's why we can have calculus based probability now, because now I can look at my sample space as just the domain, a set of numbers, and I can set up functions that talk about probability, and then I can start to do calculus with these functions, do all sorts of things. So that's really nice. This is called a random variable. Basically, you, you just let a variable be uh, representing the number of times some output will happen. Uh, so yeah, the, I define something like this, it's called a random variable. Okay, so now, 
now we can talk about Markov chains, because it talks about random variables. A Markov chain is a sequence of random variables. Uh, let's say it's x1, x2, x3, xn. We're in finite probability, so we're going to have a finite number of them. There are n random variables that I can arrange in a list. A list in a definite order is just called a sequence, so that's what a sequence means. So there are a bunch of experiments that I can define random variables for them, and now just look at a set of these functions uh, with possible outputs. Uh, one, two, three, dot, 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 going all the way up to S. That are called states of the random variables. Okay. So, for example, here my x is a random variable. What are the possible outputs? 0, 1, and 2. This is like the first output, the second output, the third output. There are s outputs here, where s equals 3. Um, so I can talk about the possible outputs of a set of random variables. Um, now, not just any set of random variables forms a Markov chain. A Markov chain is a, uh, a set of random variables that uh, have a certain relationship uh, There are two main tenets. How do I know a list of random variables forms a Markov chain? Well, one, it's based on conditional probability. So, some number in the chain uh, at uh, the n plus first term, the probability that that will output the number j, given that the previous term output the number i, And given that the term before that output the number i sub n minus 1, given that the term before that output the number i sub n minus 2, all the way down that the, the first term output the number i1. Okay. So here's, uh, here's what we're saying. So these random variables, I'm going through the list, I'm looking at what they tell me. Okay, this one gave me this number, that one gave me that number, that gave me that number, that gave me that one. Now, suppose I know what the first n of the functions do. What, will, what is the probability that the next function is going to do something? That's what I want to know. And according to the rules of the Markov chain, it says that this will always be equal to... Uh, now I'm kind of running out of space. Let's compress this a little bit. x1 equals i1. This is the probability that... The n plus guy will, the n plus first guy will give me j, given that the previous guy gave me i. In other words, uh, what I'm saying is Markov chains forget the past. The only thing I need to know to predict the future is the present. What happened several steps into the past, I don't care. So, if I want to probably that something's going to happen tomorrow, don't tell me about what happened all the days before tomorrow. Just tell me what happened yesterday what's going on today, right? So, what I know now is the only thing that is going to affect what's happening in the future, okay? So, a lot of, some, uh, some like a physics experiment might uh, be a Markov chain, right? So there's a particle at some point in space. I know its current position, I know its velocity, I know its direction. How can I predict where it's gonna be one second from now? Well, I don't need to know what that particle was doing last week. Why isn't it at home? Why is it here? Like, I don't care. I know its current position, its current velocity, and its current direction. That's all I need to know what's going to happen one second from now. I don't need to know its entire history. Right? So that is an example of a Markov chain. Uh, Any time when the probability doesn't depend on the entire history, it just depends on literally what's going on right now, that's an example of a Markov chain. So knowing how these guys will react to each other, it only goes one step into the past. <coughs> the second thing that makes a Markov chain a Markov chain is the following. 
that this guy here is independent of n. And is constant. What does that mean? Uh, to go from one step to the next, it doesn't depend on what time value you're at. So for example, what I mean is, okay, what is the probability that x7 is going to output the value 2 given that x6 output the value 1? Well, to me, that's going to be the same as the probability that x9 output the value 2 given that x8 output the value 1. That is going to be, for me, the same as the probability that x1001 output the value 2, given that the previous guy output the value 1. No matter what, what point in the list I'm at, the point of going from one state to another state is going to be the same, no matter where I'm in the list. Um, so as long as I can know, OK, people that are one unit apart, if the first one did this, the second one will do that, that would be true no matter where I pick that, two, that pair of things being one unit apart. That's it. These two things uh, create a markup chain. Now that is uh, the definition that works for finite probability. And uh, granted, it is also very abstract, and you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. So let's actually do uh, a concrete example of something that will form a markup chain. And in fact, all the problems here are going to be word problems. So once again, because I'm too lazy to write these out on the board, I, I printed them out. So. We are going to go through these examples, and I'm not sure we're going to fully explore all three of them, but we'll, we'll see what we get through today, and then we'll, we'll look at the rest. So I'm going to kind of teach you about the peculiarities of Markov chains using example one, and then we're going to apply what I teach you to examples two and three and beyond. So that's uh, these are this is what a Markov chain does: the list of random variables that can output certain values, and the output of a new value only depends on the previous value, and it doesn't really depend on anything that came before that, and if I want to know how two things in succession behave uh, with respect to each other, that behavior is guaranteed throughout the entire list, no matter at what point I look. Yeah. This run in sheets. Uh, there's definitely enough, so. Are there extra? Oh. That's two. Do you need one? Oh, oh. Jeez, technology. Okay. All right. So let's actually look at this. It turns out all of these things describe a Markov chain. So let's look at example one from uh, probability set four. Example one. So let's uh, read about that. Okay. So there's a certain type of machine at a factory. Uh, the following are true for that machine. If it is working on one day, so we have a machine, and the following is true. If working one day, there's a 90% chance it'll, it'll work the next day. Um, and if broken one day, There's an 80% chance it's working the next day. So there's a factory. There's a machine in that factory where they've had that machine a long time. They kind of know how this model behaves. And they just know, OK, at the end of the day, at the end of the work day, when you go and you're, you're closing up shop, you check the machine, OK, it's all working. 90% of the time they do that, when they come back in the morning and they turn on the machine, it'll still be working. Everything's going to be fine. They can go on with their day. Uh, so there's a 90% chance that if you check it one day, it's working, it's going to be working the next day you come into work. 
However, if you check it one day and it's broken, then of course you're going to call up the facility and say, hey, the machine is broken again, can you send someone down? 80% of the time they send someone, uh, they get it working by the next day. Uh, so that is the uh, situation with this machine. We also know that upon installation, there's a 99% chance the guy who installed it knows what he's doing and it's up and running the moment he installs it. Uh, it's working chance. Um, it's working. So what you would notice here is that uh, if I were to say the following. I'm going to let one represent it's in the working state. Let two represent it's in the broken state. And if I let xn equals uh, the state on day n, then the list x1, x2, all the way up to xn is a Markov chain. How do I know it's a Markov chain? Well, notice what we were told. The only thing I need to know about it's going to be working the next day is what was happening the previous day, right? If I want to know what's the chance that the machine is going to work tomorrow, I don't need to know what was happening last week. I just want to know what's happening today, right? I know that if you check it one day, it's going to be working 90% the other day. If it's broken one day, there's an 80% chance it's working the next day. So to know about what's going on tomorrow, I only need to know about what's going on today, right? Is it working today? Okay, there's a 90% chance that tomorrow it'll be working, right? And again, it never mentioned which particular day we're talking about. Is it a Tuesday? It never said. I just know on a particular day, if you check it, that's going to be the probability. And I know between that day and the next day, these are the probabilities. I don't really, it doesn't depend on which particular day I pick. I just know that's how the machine works between a two-day time span. So this actually represents a Markov chain, right? So I can talk about, I want to measure the state of this machine. Right? So now that is an example of a Markov chain. Let's actually do some math with this, right? So here, the x sub, x sub n is going to represent its state on day one. So for example, the state could, this function could output one or two, meaning it's working or not working. This could output one or two, etc. cetera. So uh, we define the following. Let's get some probabilities in here. Uh, the probability that uh, xn plus one equals j given that it's n equals i, we call this little p sub i j, and this is called a transitional probability. Uh, that's the name. So I can describe a Markov chain to an agent ask you, find the transitional probabilities. What I'm asking you is, uh, what is the probability that it was in this state on one day, it will be in that state on the next day? Uh, and these give the chances you will transition from state i to state j, right? Given that we're currently at i, what is the probability that the next state will be j? Now, let's actually find the transition probabilities for this example. There are only two states. So, I can ask the question, what is the probability of transitioning between all these states? For example, I can talk about p11. This is the probability that I was in a working state one day and I will be in a working state the next day, right? Given that it's working one day, what is the probability it will be working the next day? Right? 
I can also talk about, so, uh, I don't want to write these out. I probably don't want to write these out. I'm going to write down one. Okay, so this is saying that given that on day n, it's working, what is the probability that on day n plus 1, it's still working, right? So that guy is going to be, we can find that. Another transitional probability we can talk about is, okay, given that it's working today, what is going to be the probability that it's not, it's not working tomorrow? That's the second transitional probability. I can also talk about the probability, okay, suppose it's not working today, what is the probability that it will be working tomorrow? Right? I can find that probability. Okay, suppose it's not working today. What is the probability that it will still not be working tomorrow? Right? I can talk about those kinds of things. And you would notice for the two states, those are all the possibilities. There are only really four transitions that can happen. It can go from a working state and remain there or switch, or it can go from a non-working state and remain there or switch. Uh, so. I could be working one day and working the next, or I could be working one day and not working the next, or I could not be working one day and working the next, or I could be not working one day and not working the next. Now based on this example, what are these numbers? What is probably that I'm working one day and I'm working the next day? <coughs> Point 0.9. There's a 90% chance that if I'm in state 1, I will continue to be in state 1 the following day. What is the probability that I'm working one day, but I'm not working the next day? Point one, right? Literally the complement of that. Okay, what's the probability that if I'm broken one day, I will be working the next day? Point eight. Whenever you're in state two, you make a phone call, there's an 80% chance we can get you to state one by the following day. Okay, so if it's not working one day, I ask them to fix it, and I come in tomorrow, it's still not working. What is that probability? Well, it's going to be 0.2. So that means the 20% of the time when they don't get it fixed in time. What does this remind you of? Do you have anything? And maybe now it's about the point. You realize Javon has that mischievous smile on his face, which means. So just figure out a way to put matrices in this thing. Look at that. Those are the subscripts of matrices, aren't there? This is the guy in the first row, first column, first row, second column, second row, first column, second row, second column. I can, from this, I can build a matrix. The first guy, first column, first guy, second column, second guy, first column, second guy, second column. I can call this matrix 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 0.2. This matrix I will call big P, and it is called a transition matrix. Yeah, the matrices are back. We missed you. Okay, now basically what you can realize in the transition matrix is the rows tell you about the current state. And the columns will tell you about the future state. So here's row 1, row 2. Here's column 1, column 2. Basically, the guy that's here is, what is the probability that I move from state 1 to state 1? Well, it's 0.9. What is the probability that I move from state 1 to state 2? 0.1. What is the probability that I move from state 2 to state 1? Well, it's 0.8. What is the probability that I move from state 2 to state 2? It's 0.2. So I can get this matrix, which I call a transition matrix. This pretty much tells me what is the probability from jumping from one state to the next state. And because there are only two states here, I get a two by two matrix. Of course, if there were three possibilities, I would get a three by three matrix. If there are a thousand possibilities, I would get a thousand by a thousand matrix. <laughs> and that's far more likely. Usually when you're, we're using Markov chains and applications, there are thousands and millions of rows, quite literally. I'll talk about applications a little bit later. Um, so, I see some of that kind of reminds me of a Markov chain. I define my states, and then I find what is the probability of transitioning from one state to the other state. Uh, I can throw these guys in a matrix, and that's called a transition matrix. Now, there's another way to visualize this. There's actually a graphical way. So 
a very nice graphical way. And this is where the name actually comes from. It's called a transition diagram. So here's how you draw the transition diagram. The states are nodes. So I can say, okay, that point represents I'm in state one. I can take another point, okay, that point represents I'm in state two. And now I'm going to see, well, how can I jump from point one to point two? Well, it's possible that if I'm working, I will jump to a state of not working, so it's possible to travel in that direction. And I actually know what that is, but probably that I'm working and then suddenly I'm not working the following day, well, that's gonna be point one. So this happens at point one probability. It's also possible that I'm working and then, well, I jump to myself. I'm continuing to work. That probably is point nine. That's a possibility. There's a possibility that if I'm in state two, I will stay in state two. So state two loops to itself. The chances of that happening are point two. It's also possible to move from a state of state two to state one, right? chances of me making that change is 0.8. This is called a transition diagram. And hey, it looks kind of like a chain, doesn't it? There are loops, there are connections, there are links in the chain, there are, there are edges to the chain. So this is the picture of the Markov chain for this example. Right? So for this machine, I can create a Markov chain and that would be what it looks like. Um, so that's called a Markov chain, it's called a transition diagram. And pretty much I can describe how I can transition between states. If I'm in state one, there's a 90% chance that I'm going to stay in state one. There's a 10% chance that I'll jump from state one to state two. If I'm at state two, there's a 20% chance I'll remain there, but there's an 80% chance I'll jump to the next one. Um, one thing I do want you to also notice about these diagrams is that our axioms of probability were automatically built in. I want you to notice that the sum of the rows equals one. Why? Because that's all possibilities, right? If I'm in state one, I can stay there or I can leave. That's a, all possibilities. So the, along the rows, the sum will be equal to one. What I also want you to notice here, how does, how does that represent on the diagram? Is that the sum of arrows emanating from a point they must all add up to one, right? So if I'm in, in situation one, notice that point one is coming out of it and point nine is coming out of it, that adds up to one, that needs to be the case. So if you write a matrix and the rows don't add up to one, or you draw a chain like this and the arrows leave in a point, don't add up to one, you did not draw a Markov chain, you are not describing a probabilistic situation. Um, there are versions of this where Pretty much what I said about rows, they apply to columns and it's like a whole transpose of everything I'm talking about, but your textbook does it this way, so I'm going to do it this way. You kind of go by the rows and arrows leaving a point, they have to add up to one. So that, that's, uh, that's, that's how we can visualize this example. So here's another thing that we can get from this example. There's another important matrix. more than one of them, so I'll just, I'll, I'll introduce the initial state matrix. So the notation for this matrix is big S, and in fact I will put a subscript of one to, to talk about, this is the first state, the initial state. And this is just a row matrix that pretty much describes the states, right? So here there's state one is possible, here state two is possible. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the probability that I'm in state one and the probability that I'm in state two in the very beginning, right? This is called the initial state matrix. Um, so in the very beginning of this experiment, what is the probability that I'm in state one? From this, this example, example one. 
99%, there's a 99% chance that the machine is working from the very beginning. Which means there's a 1% chance that the machine is in state two in the very beginning, right? So I can have a matrix looking like this and that represents what is the initial state. So that's kind of, that's kind of the setup. Right? So I can talk about a, a, a situation that can be described as a Markov chain. I can find transition properties. I can find a transition matrix. I can draw a transition diagram. And I can find an initial state matrix. Now, um, the setup is only as good as the problems it allows us to solve. So some questions we'd like to answer. So, knowing what's happening tomorrow is good and all, but I'd like to know what's going to happen a week from now, or a month from now, or two years from now, right? If I sell a 23-year-old an insurance policy, I want to know, at 60 years old, what's going to be happening to this kid? Am I, have, am I going to have to pay out the insurance <coughs> policy? At that point, is the money he's paying to me going to be more than the money I'm paying to him? So. Predicting something one step in advance isn't actually good enough. We want to be able to make predictions long term. That would be the gold standard. Can I predict the future 10, 20, 30 years down the road? I don't want to know what happens one day to the next. I want to know what's going to happen 2,000 days from now. Now that's a very different question. It's very difficult. So one is we want to be able to say uh, what is the probability will be in state i n steps from now, where n is just some finite number. Right? So that's the question I'd want to be able to answer. Yes, I know the machine is working today, but in two months' time we're going to have an inspection, it's going to be a big deal, the mayor's going to come, and going to, you know, I want to know, what is the probability that I'm going to be embarrassed, right? What is the probability that when the mayor shows up two months from now, the machine that is currently working, that I'm watching right now, was well, probably that in two months it'll still be working. If he shows up, right, 60 days from now, what is the chance that it's going to be fine? Everything's going to go perfect, right? I want to be able to answer that question. Uh, another thing that we want to be able to answer is, um, what is the long-term behavior? the xn. That is the kind of question that goes like this. There's no definite time in the future. I don't really care about necessarily 60 days in the future, but just in the long run, indefinitely, right? I know what's going on now. If I come back some unspecified time in the future, which might be a long time from now, what are the chances that I'm going to see the machine working versus not working, right? So I want to be able to ask, I want to know exactly n days from now, what's going on, versus you know, a while from now, some unspecified time. If I were to randomly show up, is the machine going to be working? That's another question we want to be able to ask. Uh, we're going to be answering these two. Uh, the third question we're not really going to get into, but it's something like, what is the expected value of the state? Right? What can I expect in the, is going to happen in the long run? Right? What is the probability that I'm going to be able to expect it to be working? Now, ultimately we're going to be able to answer the first two. We're not really going to do the third. Uh, but that's, uh, that's kind of the situation. How would we go about actually doing that, though, based on our setup? So here's what we're going to do. So let's work through this uh, question. Suppose we're currently in state one. What is the probability? We'll be in state one two days from now. Okay, so I know the chances of being uh, one day from now. What is two days from now? So here's how you can actually uh, think about that situation. Let me... 
uh, draw the redraw the diagram so you can actually see. Because one way to do it is with the picture, but we're going to realize that that has limitations, so we are going to want a better way. 90% chance, 10% chance, and 2% chance, 8% chance. Okay. So if I know I'm currently in this state, let's make a prediction for two days from now, a probabilistic prediction. Okay, so I start out in state one, right? I want to make two jumps, right? So this is the first day after and the second day after, right? So the question is, uh, how? what are the chances that I'm in state one? How many ways that that can happen? That after I'm going through two cycles, I end up in state one. What are the possibilities? What is the possibility for the next day? Huh? Yeah, what does that point nine mean? There's a probability that the next day will also be in state one. Okay, so it can be in state one for all three of these days, right? I can be in state one, tomorrow I'm in state one, the next day I'm also in state one, so I never really change, right? Or, what can happen? I can be in state one, it's stopped, it's not working the next day, but then they get it fixed the next day, right? Those are the only two ways I can go from state one to state one. I can be, the ways that I can be here and stay there is either I stay there two days in a row, or I go over here and then come back, right? You can see from the diagram. Basically, you're, you're trying to figure out all the possible paths from point one to point one that have two steps in them, right? So now let's actually look at what this means. To make this jump from here to here, what are the chances that that's going to happen? So that there's a point nine, right? And given that this is working, what's probably that it, it'll jump like that? It's again point nine, so okay, point nine and point nine. Or, well, it's a mutual exclusive situation, isn't it? So I would put plus. Probably that I jump from one to two. Uh, probably that I jump from two to one. Huh? One eight. So that is the probability that if I know I'm working today, I'll be working two days from now. Uh, what I want you to notice here is that uh, that's actually Bayes' theorem, right? Basically, this guy here is the probability, uh, what is probably that I, I would be in state one given that I was in state one times the probability that I was in state one. Uh, here is what is the probability that I will jump to state one given that I was in state two times the probability of being in state two. Um, notice that this ultimately, both of these add up to the probability of being in state one with base there in version one unofficial. Right? You can actually realize that. Just me looking about how to go around this diagram, <coughs> it builds up base there. So, okay, so I'm kind of uh, okay with jumping around this diagram. But is there another way to do this? Because if you were to ask me what's happening a thousand days from now, I don't want to look at all possibilities <laughs> like a thousand days from now. I'll go crazy. Um, here's another way you can get that same expression. What if I were to take P and multiply by P? So here's a matrix, 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.8, uh, 0 0.2, and 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.2. Remember, matrix multiplication has been for Okay. If I were to multiply these two, uh, it would be this times this plus that times that, right? And for the second state, it would be this times that. This here will be this times that uh, plus 
twenty times. There's a plus minus. Okay. This times that plus this times that. And then point eight times one plus point two times point two. I want you to notice that the first coordinate here is actually that guy right there. Right? What does that mean? I was in, this is the point 1 comma 1. That's the location 1, 1. That's saying I moved to 1 and I stayed at 1. What are the chances of that happening? Look in position 1 comma 1. It, it satisfies Bayes' theorem, and it satisfies just like common sense, <coughs> and I can figure that out from matrix multiplication. In other words, P squared tells me about the transitions two days later. How would I find out what's going on three days from now? Well, P2. 10 days from now, p to the 10th power, right? So on and so forth. Uh, so it turns out that matrix multiplication kind of falls in line with Bayes' theorem, which kind of helps me predict what's going on multiple steps in the future. So if I wanted to know, well, what's kind of, how things will play out a thousand days from now, all I have to do is find p to the 1,000. Now that's not easy in general, but we're, there, there are techniques to actually make it easier. But I kind of want you to see how matrix multiplication is going to look into this. Um, so uh, that is an example. Here's another example of matrix multiplication. Now this multiplication that I'm going to show is probably the more important one. So. this question. Okay. Looking back at this machine. It was installed today. Okay. So all I know is it was installed today. I don't know if the guy did the job correctly and it's actually working. I just know it was installed. I don't know if it's working. What is the probability it's working tomorrow? Curiously enough, here's one way I can figure that out. I can start with the initial state matrix. Okay. It was installed today. This matrix is going to tell me about the current situation. What is the current probability that it's in state 1 versus state 2. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to multiply by the transition matrix to kind of figure out if this was the given state, what is the probability that I'll, how, how things will transition after one step. Um, basically, I'm going to now have 0 0.99, 0 0.01. I'm going to multiply that by the 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.2. Notice that that will give me, so this is a, a 1 by 2 multiplied by a 2 by 2, so that should give me a 1 by 2 matrix. Right, so this should have two entries like that. Uh, what's the first entry going to be? Well, it's going to be this times this plus that times that. Okay, 
what are those numbers representing? So probability question. What is that? The probability is working tomorrow. This is actually what's going on in the second day. Notice again what happens in the first place is Bayes' theorem. What is probably that it's working tomorrow? Well, it could be working tomorrow given that it's working today, or it could be working tomorrow given that it's not working today. Right? So that is Bayes' theorem. This is just the probability that it's working. What's probably that it's not working tomorrow? Well, that's the probability that it is not working tomorrow given that it's working today, plus the probability that it is working tomorrow given that it's working today. So you would have Bayes' theorem, which pretty much tells you that this here is the probability we're in state one on day two. And this is the probability we're in state two on day two. This is this defining another state. I will call this the state matrix two. So that is the second state matrix. I have the first state matrix. This is the probability upon installation. Now, assuming those probabilities, what is the transition between day one and day two? Well, it's going to be this. If there, if there was a 99% chance that it was installed correctly, what's the chance that it's working tomorrow? 89.9% chance it's working tomorrow. Now, of course, I can talk about what's going on in day three. What would I do if I want to figure out what's going on in day three? Right, I'm going to take this and figure out how it transitions by taking that and multiplying by that. So if I wanted to S3, that is simply going to be S2 times P. But notice that S2 was actually uh, S1 times P, so that ends up being P squared. If I wanted to find S4, that will be S3 times P, but that's just going to be S1 where I multiplied P three times if I wanted to find what's going on the fifth day. Well, that's going to be what's going on the fourth day times the probability of transitioning <coughs> to, throughout all the states. That is going to actually be some what was going on the first day and multiply this guy by four, and so on and so forth. So I can find uh, the state matrices. Now, I'm going to fill in some numbers there. I think I actually did the, the calculation before. Let's actually do that. So, I actually did these calculations, uh, hopefully. I remember doing them, did I write them down? Please tell me I wrote them down. If I didn't, you guys are gonna have to use your calculators. Oh, I actually did up to S6, believe it or not. So, uh, this guy, S3, ends up being the matrix 0.8889. One 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 zero one. I calculated S four, and this ends up being zero point eight 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 nine nine zero point one two three four zero one. That was S four. Calculated S five. This was. Eight, 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 nine, one, two, three, four, five. I even computed it as six. I think I kind of wanted to show up higher in here. This is point. I think this had one that's it. Eight, eight, eight. There are five eights in this one, and then a nine. And then there were six ones. Point one, 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 one. But how is S4 and S3 different? So S4 had four ones, and then a zero one. And S5 had five ones. No, it's four to be. Oh, S S three had three ones. Should have been two ones. Should have been two ones. It should. Did you actually do it? 
I, I did it in a little corner right here, so I, I might have. There were 888s and 111s. I probably figured out the numbers slightly correctly. But I think at the end of the day, you do kind of see something happening here, some sort of pattern. Um, what do you think the states are going towards? If I could ask that question. If I kept running this, S sub 1 million, what do you think that's going to kind of look like? Yeah. Like point A repeating and point, point A forever, and then point one forever, which means through doing this, I can kind of see well at some point way off in the future. If I were to show up some random day way off in the future, what is the chances that this machine is going to be working? There's an 88 percent chance of that happening. So let me define these guys. By the way, these are the so. Simultaneously, I kind of showed you how I can figure out what's going on on a specific day in the future. And basically, the goal is, hopefully by computing a bunch of them, you can kind of see a pattern where you can extrapolate what's going to happen in an indefinite time into the future. These are the state matrices. We define them by a... Uh, Sn is equal to S1 times P to the N minus 1, and this is the N state matrix. It gives the probability of being in any state N steps into the future. And the N minus 1 step, I think. And that's a good predictor because uh, the situation that I'm describing is a Markov chain. So for me to find the probability is just a repeated use of Bayes' theorem. And it just so happens by creating transition matrices, I have a very concise way of expressing Bayes' theorem working in each possible transition scenario. Uh, it's just a matrix multiplication. I think your book probably did n plus 1 here and then should end here. That's, that's n steps into the future, but I think you kind of get the idea. Um, now, these are called the state matrices. Now, to answer, so this allows us to answer the first question. This helps us answer one, right? What is going on n days in the future? What is the probability I'm going to be in one state versus another state? Now, to answer Q2, we want to see if the if the S ends are approaching some matrix. This, by the way, is called a steady state matrix. Um, it is the matrix the states approach. may or may not exist. Not all Markov chains have, uh, have such a thing. That's, uh, that is probably, to answer the long-term question, the idea is, I'm going to want to be able to search for that guy. Is there such a thing that if I keep computing states over and over, they settle somewhere to the point where I can say, in the long term, that's what's going on. Um, and it appears with the previous example I just gave, it seems to be settling at point eight 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 and point one 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 one, like a lot of ones forever, right? Um,
So again, let's let let's actually see how we would uh, compute this guy if it actually exists. Um, so here, it seems S bar exists, right? Just by eyeballing it. Um, how could we find it? Essentially, this is going to be the state that everyone is going towards, right? Everyone wants to be that guy, right? You know that guy that everyone wants to be like? That guy, which I was like that guy, right? Everyone wants to be like that, like that guy, including that guy, right? Man, I wish people was good. I was as good as people say This guy is like the, the standard, the gold standard. You want to get to that. That's, that's amazing, because that allows you to predict the future into eternity, right? Um, so, what does it mean to be this matrix, the guy that everyone goes towards? It means that if you ever got to be him, what would he go towards? Himself. himself. Notice that S bar is going to ful it, it fulfills this equation. S bar, if I transition that, doesn't go anywhere. Right? That actually makes sense. If everyone is heading towards him, who is he heading towards? Himself. So, given that idea, so if S bar exists, it must fulfill that equation. How do you think of solving that? How do you try to figure out who that is? I know exactly what P is, but I don't know what S bar is. How do you figure it out? Ideas? Yeah, calculus. Limits for not calculus. <laughs> I know it has that idea from calculus, but we don't actually need calculus. Just like eyeballing, just do like just do a million. There's a, a more efficient way. So here's what we would do. I don't know what it is, so just use the variable. I, I want to find something. Set it equal to x. We're going to do the same thing. Set it equal to, say, x, y, right? Where my goal would be to find what is x and y. So this would mean that x, y, if I multiply that by 0 0.9, 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.2, the result should be <coughs> x, y. So what does this actually mean? That means 0.9x plus 0.8y, using matrix multiplication, 0.1x plus 0.2y. Over here, I would have 0.9x plus 0.1x. 0.1x plus 0.2y. And over here, I would have, uh, I think I have zero. Oh, okay. what am I doing? I'm going crazy. This times that was this. Right? This times that is this. You only get a 2 by 1, so there's no second row. That, I was, thought I was going crazy repeating myself. Okay. And it's that. Now, what we know about matrix uh, equality, corresponding entries must be equal, right? So this must be equal to that. And this must be equal to that. So that means uh, 0.9x plus 0.8y must be equal to x. And it's also true that 0.1x plus 0.2y must be equal to y. I can subtract x from both sides. Right? So that would give me what? minus 0.1x plus 0.8y equals 0. I can subtract y from one of these sides. And I will get 0.1x minus 0.8y equals 0.
Now, one thing you'll notice here, so we get a system of gradients, essentially. So I'm going to solve for x and y. Now, here's one thing you'll notice if you throw this into a matrix. Uh, it's actually dependent, right? One equation is just a, a multiple of the other, which means I can actually solve it. However, I do have an additional piece of information, right? What is the relationship between x and y? Well, it's the set of all probability distributions. So it's also the case that x plus y must be equal to 1. So I'm going to use that. That's always going to be true because it's a set of probabilities. So this is going to be my system of equations. Solve that system for x and y, and that will tell me uh, if this actually works. Now, what is that? How can we solve this for x and y? I can say multiply this the top equation through by 10, and so I would get 1 uh, minus 8, 0, 1, 1, 1. So I'll put the 1, 1, 1 up here. I can take row 1, so let's take row 2 minus row 1. This minus that, 0. This minus that, 9. This minus that, 1. And then I can take 9 row 1 minus row 2. It's going to be 9, 0, 8, 0, 9, 1. And then finally, I can just divide the top row by 9. So row 1 divided by 9 divide the bottom row by 9, row 2 divided by 9. So this is 1, 0, 8 over 9. And this is 0, 1, 1 over 9. Now plug in 8 over 9 into a calculator. What does it tell you? Point eight, 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 forever, right? And then 1 over 9 is going to be point one 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 forever. Right, so this actually means that the x, and remember, this is the probability in state one, long term. My x is going to give me 8 over 9. This is 0.888, well, forever. And my y, this is the probability in state two, long term. That's going to be 1 over 9, 0.111 forever. I want to at least just draw the picture for the second one, but I don't think we'll have time for that. Maybe I'll, I'll instead just move ahead here and tell you about uh, some new ideas. So if a, uh, if a state matrix, if a steady state matrix exists, that's how you find it. Just set up variables to be the, the entries, and then multiply it by the transition matrix, set it equal to itself. Um, you'll get a bunch of equations. Usually one or two of them will be dependent, so what you do is you throw in a last equation that just says pretty much if I add all these variables, I will add up to one, because that's always going to be true. You'll be able to solve the system. If the system has a solution, then it's going to, you're going to know what the long-term behavior is. And if the system does not have a solution, it means the long-term behavior is not predictable. It's essentially what it means. But the ones that are predictable are nice, uh, we like them, and we call them something else. We call them uh, regular Markov chains. So, definition. A Markov chain is called regular. It's transition matrix has only positive
positive entries or some power of p. So you develop a transition matrix for a particular Markov chain. You might have zeros in some entries. In the next example, you'll actually have that. Um, now, if you multiply p by itself over and over, and there comes a point where eventually all the entries are positive numbers, there are no zeros left over, we call that Markov chain regular. Zero. Regular Markov chains have have a steady state matrix. So how do you know that uh, such a matrix would even exist? Uh, basically, see if any power of p has only positive entries. For if p itself has positive entries, that's good enough. As you can see, rp here had only positive entries, so I knew there was a steady state matrix. Uh, there is another theory. If s bar exists, then all sk will approach s bar regardless of the starting S1, which is crazy when you think about it, but that's true. That's one situation. Whenever the state of state matrix exists, you'll always end up there, no matter where you actually started. I can assume that there was a 10% chance of being in this state and a 90% chance of being in the other state, or there's a 50% chance of being here and a 50% chance of being there, or there's a 40 here and a 60 there. Ultimately, if this guy exists, and I repeat this experiment, they will all settle to the steady state matrix, no matter where I started from. So that's important. Another thing that's important is that uh, if I keep repeating powers, taking powers of matrices is really annoying. And there are a couple ways you can make this short, but in the state of the regular Markov chain, this is also going to approach a predictable matrix. Where so I can figure out the long-term probability transition matrix. <coughs> P-bar consists of all rows equal to the S-bar. So, example, for the above. Example one, I'm talking about. Our S bar, we saw what that is. That is actually uh, 8 over 9, 1 over 9. And that means that the P bar, meaning if I were to take uh, P raised to powers and let the powers go off to infinity, if I just take higher and higher powers, just keep multiplying this guy forever, what's he going to settle at? He will settle at a 2 by 2 matrix that in each row, that guy is showing up. So 8 over 9, 1 over 9, 8 over 9, 1 over 9. So in the long term, what is the probability that you transition from a state of 1 to a state of 1? So if I started working, what is the probability that I'm going to be working at some far point in the future? 8 over 9. If I started uh, not working, what is the probability that I will be working at some point far in the future? 8 over 9. If I started working, what is probably that I'm, I won't be working at some point far in the future? Well, 1 over 9. If I started not working, what is probably that if I showed up far in the future that I'm still not working? 1 over 9. Um, so, there are so many cool things you can get from that application. It's not even funny. I'll talk about some, uh, I guess, starting next time. Uh, but we'll stop there. What you can try to do is actually try to read, because next time we'll go through these examples, actually try to do the questions for these other ones, see how much you actually understand. Uh, you should be able to do all, everything I ask you here. So for these two examples, they describe Markov chains, find the transition matrix, draw the transition diagram, and make some predictions. So I will see you guys on Monday. Yeah, I think